Welcome to Learning DSLR Back to Basics. My name is Phil Dame. In this episode, episode 5, I'm going to be covering three important topics. The difference between RAW, Camera RAW, and JPEG as image formats, histograms, and the concept of exposing to the right. So as you know, probably, if you have a DSLR camera, when you take a picture, you have actually two choices for storing the image. You can either store the image as a JPEG, which you're probably most familiar with, or the camera's special RAW format. And a RAW format might have various extensions based on the type of camera you have. Canon typically uses a .CR2 extension, whereas Nikon uses a .NEF. When you look at the size difference, you have to ask yourself, what exactly is this RAW file, and is it worth justifying a 500% increase in storage? And what I want to show you today is that, in fact, a RAW file is significantly uh, better than JPEGs, and it's something that I personally choose to only shoot in. Camera RAW is effectively the image sensor data with little to no processing at all. It's everything that your camera was built to capture, plus some extra data about how your camera was set up at the time. If you compare that to JPEGs, um, JPEGs are actually conversions of those RAW formats, but done directly in your camera. So that right on your memory card, you've got a JPEG, which is easy to share, print, um, or put on the web. And again, Camera Raw is a direct output of that raw format into your memory card, and you need software for processing that is got some knowledge about your specific camera make and model. So in summary, uh, JPEG is a very small file, relatively speaking, and it has compression, the kind of compression that actually degrades some of the image quality because it's losing some information every time you save it. As I mentioned, it's processed by the camera, standardized format, and because it is a tighter, smaller, and more compressed file, you're going to lose some of the total range that could theoretically be available to you. So from the darkest dark to the brightest bright, you're not going to have quite as dynamic a range. And white balance, which I talk about in episode four of Learning DSLR Back to Basics, white balance is something that is kind of baked into a JPEG. Once you choose a daylight white balance and that might be chosen for you during auto white balance, that's baked into the file. So you can make small adjustments, but you can't make radical adjustments in quite the same way as you can with RAW. And JPEGs uh, don't have as much color range. They have in total millions of colors, but that's still not as much as RAW. So RAW it's a much larger file, in part because it's totally uncompressed, but it is in fact storing more information. As I mentioned, it requires additional software for processing to create the JPEG or any other format. It is proprietary all the way down to a camera make and model. So a Canon 7D and a Canon 60D don't even share the same RAW file format, so it requires your image editing or operating system to get understanding of camera RAW for that make and model. Since it is storing more information, it's got a better dynamic range of the darks to the highlights. And one of the more important aspects of RAW is that the white balance is not baked in. So you can make a radical change in the Kelvin value, and again, I'd re refer to episode four about white balance, without having any negative impact on the actual image during post-processing. And then the other great advantage to RAW is that it just has a lot more information about the colors that were captured, and, and that's described as having greater color depth, and I'll talk about that more. So as far as colors go, JPEGs are defined as an 8-bit format, and what that really means in decimal terms is that each pixel for red, green, and blue can have 256 levels of brightness. So each pixel, 256 reds, 256 greens, and 256 blues. And when you multiply all that out, you get 16.7 million possible colors per pixel. Sounds like a lot until you look at what a camera can produce nowadays. Modern day Canon and Icon cameras shoot 14-bit RAW image formats. And that's actually a 16,000 and higher levels per color. And if you were to multiply that 16,000 times 16,000 times 16,000, you end up with 4.4 trillion colors. And 4.4 trillion is 4 million, 400,000 million. So it's significantly more colors to work with. And you obviously don't see all those colors, but 
you have the latitude to make adjustments such as white balance and other post-processing development needs and have great kind of fidelity of the colors when you're done. So let's take a look at white balance for example. So here's a picture of my daughter uh, when she was just a few months old and I had purposely uh, pushed the white balance way off uh, just to make a, a, an example of this for one of my blog posts. So what I've done here is I know that her shirt is white and so using Adobe Lightroom, but you can use any tool, I had told the software that the white collar on her shirt was, uh, was white and is thus a neutral color and to make an adequate adjustment by removing the color cast from the photo. And if I do that to a raw file, it works perfectly. I get a neutral shirt, her skin tones return to normal, and I've got great overall coverage, no issues in terms of exposure. If I make that exact same adjustment, but I only had a JPEG that had the same bluish tones, this is the result. The shirt becomes neutral, but the skin tones and other colors just don't have the latitude necessary to move into, uh, uh, in such a way to remove the blue cast without causing overexposure, and in fact creates a quite uh, unpleasant color on her skin. So here's, so here's the, all three together. So this in itself makes, for me, uh, the ability to nail the white balance perfectly in post-processing one of the most compelling reasons to use RAW. When thinking about um, the dynamic range of, uh, of an image and how much uh, data is captured, it's good to think about histograms. And a histogram is really just a plotting of all the different light levels in a particular image. And you can see this directly on your camera or in the software you're using for post-processing. On the left you've got pure black and on the right you've got pure white. And it's really a bar chart but there's so many bars touching one another it starts to look like a continuous line sweeping out an area. But um, uh, there's nothing more than it just adding up. How many shadows do we have? We have this many and that's how tall the bar is. And there's no right or wrong histogram. It all depends on the kind of image being shot. So. If you were shooting a landscape, for example, you might have a lot of bright sky and very little of the image might be some dark mountains in the foreground. So it might look like this. If you were shooting a night shot, you might have obviously a lot of darks, but then you might have a blip where the lights or the moon represents some highlights on the right side of the histogram. So if you look at a histogram from all the way to the far left to the far right, you've got a certain number of bars being drawn, a um, certain number of light levels that exist. And in a JPEG, you've got 256 levels from left to right. And that's a, you know, only a certain amount. So if you take just this, just this fifth of the, of the uh, histogram and look at it, it's really made up of a bunch of bars. And if I was to take this image that this represents and say, you know what, this is a little bit underexposed, I should really brighten it a bit, thus pulling my darker midtones into the highlights. That works just fine, but if you do that to a JPEG, it's possible that it, the adjustment leaves gaps, and so you have missing information in between each bar, so to speak, and that means that you don't have a continuous tone, and this kind of tonal skipping is really not desired because it's going to create banding in the image. It's subtle, but it does decrease the overall quality of the image. And if you had a large kind of gradient area, like a blue sky that's changing from various shades of blue, you might start to actually see the banding in the sky. Now, if you take a step back and think about how does your camera actually function, it, it might actually be quite surprising to learn that your camera doesn't capture light proportionally. And in fact, dedicates an disproportionate amount of the file as information for detailing or writing down information about the highlights or the bright portions of the image. So much so that the brightest fifth of the image takes up half of the file size. In episode two of Learning DSLR Back to Basics, I talk about light stops. So I, uh, I'm going to talk about light stops here, so be sure to refer to that if you're not familiar with it. But a stop of light tells you is a factor of two change in light. And a typical DSLR can, camera can capture a dynamic range of about five stops. So the first fifth, the first stop of light in the brightest highlights is capturing half as much, half of the data in your file. And then it goes down by half for each stop of light all the way down. So you've got 50, 25, 12, six, and six. 
And although your file is made up this way, of course you don't look at the file in this way. You, each stop of light is equal to one another. And so your camera has to actually map out or kind of squeeze the information so that you've got even distribution of shadows to highlights. So when you look at it this way, it's even more dramatic. You now realize that the top fifth of your histogram, or the top fifth of the highlights, is being described with half of the information, half of the file size uh, of the actual capture. So bringing that back to the histogram, so I've got the same stops of light going from right to left. I know that the JPEG has 256 levels of brightness across all of it, and now I know that half of it is in uh, is used to describe the very first stop of light, the first fifth in the highlights. And I also know that JPEGs are produced inside the camera, but they're also produced not just directly from the raw. There's extra things that are happening, things to increase contrast and saturation and sharpness and so on. And it, it turns out that this is just an example. The final JPEG is going to have even less information in the highlights and almost like a redistribution and some loss of information. So you end up with maybe 200 discrete levels of brightness. Now where this is really impactful is when you compare it to a raw file. A raw file has 16,000 brightness levels, if you recall, from left to right. And when you take half of that for the first fifth, you've got 8,000 levels of brightness to describe the brightest fifth of the image. And then another 4,000 for the next uh, fifth, and so on and so forth, all the way down. So this concept of exposing to the right really comes from the fact that um, cameras capture information the way that they do. And if you were to look at this histogram, you could say, hey, I captured this uh, image, and uh, the file, I mean, the image always looks the same, but I'm using only half of the file to describe the image. Wouldn't it be better to use more of the file, capture more of the data in the highlight area so that I'm making better use of the ca capture mechanism of the actual image sensor. Um, and so you could argue that maybe 50% of the data here is missing. It's the same image, but I'm using a lot less data to describe it. So if I was to able to expose the same scene and push my histogram to the right, and that means overexposing, making sure that the image is as bright as possible, I'm going to use, I'm going to end up with the same image in the end, brighter image, but that's something I can adjust later, and I'm going to have a lot more data to work with. And in fact, cameras these days are able to capture extra highlight data by almost a full stop because, again, in the raw file, I've got 8,000 levels that I'm going to cram into a very small space. You're not, you're not actually seeing all of it. And areas that may look overexposed uh, are in fact there. So this is something you have to do with trial and error, but I can ex overexpose by about a stop on my camera and know that using um, what's called the recovery slider or just by decreasing my overall exposure, I can, after I take the picture, I can bring back some of the overexposed areas that would have been pure white and bring them back so that I can view all the details. This is not something I would recommend doing with JPEG certainly nothing you would do with film. But with digital files, you've got more data in the raw format than you can work with, so you're able to kind of play with that and for the first time really specifically shoot for the way the DSLR camera functions by overexposing and then pulling in the data back. If you did the opposite and underexposed by a stop, you'd have half as much information to work with or less, and then you'd make it brighter, you'd actually be introducing a lot of noise and unwanted speckling. So that's it. I hope I've made my case for the raw format and uh, the concept of histograms and why and how they work and how you can use those to the advantage. And consider exposing to the right, really focusing on getting correct bright exposures, if not a touch overexposed with the knowledge that you're going to do some post-processing afterwards, maximizing the data that you're giving yourself to work with. If you haven't already done so, please check out my blog at learningdslr.com or connect with me on the social web on Facebook or Twitter at LearningDSLR. Thanks for watching.